Hello, fellow writers. It's good to be talking to you again. Um, I apologize for the lateness of this lecture, but uh, I wanted to make sure that I had organized all the thoughts of the things that I wanted to talk about today. Um, uh, I wanted to thank you first for the comments that you put on the forum that was asking you for feedback on the class. It's a, a lonely thing to work online, um, as I'm sure you recognize. And uh, so I'm not sure always if what I'm doing or what I'm saying or what I'm posting is coming across and if I can, uh, if you're understanding where we're trying to get to um, in a classroom, I can look at your faces, I can uh, look at your notes, I can look at the work we produce on a daily basis and get a really mu a much more clear idea about where students are. Online, it's a little harder and um, sometimes I because of my nature, my, my own personal questioning in nature, I move into an existential crisis on whether or not we're actually accomplishing anything. Your comments help me understand, uh, help me see that, that things are clear, that we're moving along, that you're learning things, that you're appreciating the work of the class. I did want to address one of the uh, primary comments that I saw on the boards, which was that uh, there's a lot of work in the class and um, that you're, you know, that it's it seems to be organized and you seem to be getting through it, but that it is a lot of work. And I'll say a couple things about that. One is, uh, just by luck of the draw, you got a professor who uh, believes in work and who believes that you, we, everybody, gets better re with writing through the act of reading and writing. That in fact, I don't grade on grammar and I don't teach grammar. I don't teach, uh, teach structure all that much. I actually don't teach a lot of really practical, solid lessons on this is how you write an introduction or this is how you do a transition. What I, what I really believe, and, and research backs me up on this, is that we become better readers and writers. We become more standard with our language. We become clearer. We become more effective the more that we read and write. It's a, it's a matter of practice. Now, sometimes that practice can be guided, and I think that's why a class is useful because you can get guidance and you can get feedback and that, that helps with the improving and the developing of the writer. Um, but the, the, the truth is we don't actually learn that much through all those grammar exercises you learned all the way through school. What we learn from is the act of reading and the act of writing. So we have a lot of it in this class. Uh, it is an English class. It's also a college English class. Um, and I would also say that as far as if you compared the work that people do in my classes compared to other college English classes, um, my classes tend to be a little bit more intense. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're harder, or it doesn't mean that um, that I'm asking a ridiculous amount. It just means that I take the job of teaching it very serious. It's a very serious enterprise. Um, one other thing, and this is important to point out, you are in an online class, and that means that everything you do in the online class is reading and writing. Everything. And since you're in a writing class, that means the work that you're doing is writing, and then everything you have to do for the class is reading and writing. That gets to be a big labor. So um, I'll just point that out. I want to uh, talk about a few things today. and. Um, I won't try, I'll try to keep this as I've been trying to keep it under 20 minutes or so. Uh, it might go a little bit longer uh, because what I want to talk about is the role of commentary in the world and the role of commentary in a democracy and why we're doing a commentary for this paper assignment. Uh, I should point out that the due date for the paper assignment has changed. It was originally going to be this Sunday and instead we're going to kick it back to the next Sunday. I sent you an email to this effect. And uh, let me make sure I check the date. The next Sunday is uh, October 9th. That will be that will be when writing number two will be due for workshop. Um, so the role of commentary in democracy and, and why we're doing a commentary. I don't know about you, but whenever I didn't mean to get so close there. Sorry. Uh, what, whenever I watch a movie that means something to me, or whenever I'm watching a TV show that I really love, something that I really care about, not just a casual show that my um, we have on in the house, my wife 
who's watching that I kind of see. I don't care as much about something that like a cooking show or something like that. Uh, but I do care about some shows, and I do care. I do get pretty involved in some shows. I'll just tick off a few. Uh, the Sopranos, one of my all-time favorite shows. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'm a big Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan. The West Wing. You can kind of see why I'd be interested in the West Wing. So there are some shows that I watch that um, that, I, that have really affected me. One of the things that I do sometimes when I finish watching an episode or uh, of a show that I really like or see a movie that I really like is I kind of go and check out reviews. I like to read reviews after it. I like to read commentaries on what I've seen. And this isn't because when I watch, I can't really understand what's being said, or I can't understand the plot of the story, or I can't understand whether or not I liked it. It's because I like to reaffirm my own beliefs, or to be challenged on my beliefs, or to see what, how somebody else understood it. The commentary is an, a, a genre of writing that allows people to try to make the world be understood for other people. And sometimes that genre of writing, that commentary, is about things we have no idea about. And somebody writes a commentary, and we learn something about a subject, and then we also get get some idea of how we should feel about that subject, how what we should think about that subject. Sometimes the commentary is about something that we know a lot about or that we have experienced, and the commentary helps us understand that experience more. So, for instance, uh, the uh, there was a presidential debate two nights ago. You may have found yourself. Uh, if you were, had any interest in the debate, reading articles online to find out what they said about Donald Trump or what they said about Hillary Clinton or what they said about the reception of the debate. And what you were really seeking out if you were reading those articles online was commentary. You were looking for somebody else to tell you what they thought about it, what, 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 why it was meaningful. You probably had your own meanings already, but reading commentary helped you uh, clarify those meanings, helped you put them into words. That's the role of commentary. And people do look to authors to make the world make sense. They look for commentaries to help them understand, to find language for their own ideas. In a democracy, that role of commentary allows us to really start to clarify for people who align with our ideas what those ideas are. It allows us to, to state in clear ways why our ideas, our identities, our feelings, our beliefs matter within a democracy. While in a democracy, all voices are, should be equal, all voices have equal, equal rights to participation, the truth is, is that some voices speak louder than the others. It doesn't mean necessarily that they have more power for governance, although sometimes that happens. What it means is that some voices speak louder. So there are some commentators who have a lot of power. And here we can think about um, uh, John Stewart uh, on The Daily Show as a commentator, which is, he's no longer there. Or we could think about Bill O'Reilly on Fox News. Or we could think about ta Coates writing for The Atlantic Monthly. There are some commentators that have a lot of power because of the power of their voices. For this assignment, we're practicing that power. I'm asking you to practice writing a commentary. And um, in order to help you do that, you have a textbook uh, or a textbook chapter. The chapter that you're reading, and I think this is probably going to come out backwards, but it comes from the book, The Call to Write, which is one of my favorite all-time college t writing textbooks. Unfortunately, it's too expensive for me to make uh, students buy it anymore. Uh, it's way up there. But it is one of my favorite all-time books because it really asks students to envision themselves as writers, to see where their calls to write come from, and to try to meet the demands of those calls. So one of the chap my favorite chapter out of that book is the chapter that I posted online for you, the uh, commentary chapter. And I, I'm, I ask you to read that chapter pretty carefully, to think about what Trimber says about the commentary as he defines it, to read the, um, the Eric Liu essay, Remember When Public Spaces ha uh, Didn't Have Brand Names, to read the, how, the guide to writing a commentary chapter, read that chapter fairly carefully, and then try to apply it to the assignment that you've got. Again, the assignment you have 
is asking you to find an art, uh, a news event, something that has happened in the last month, something that you can pinpoint and point to and, and interpret and analyze, and then to help us understand it, to make it meaningful through your comments, through your ideas on that event. In order to help you make those comments and ideas, I'm also asking you to use the, artic the articles out of the, um, our textbook and, and to use some of those thinkers to help you clarify, to help you make more meaningful your own ideas. So let me say a couple other things about commentary, particularly in regards to our reading this week. Uh, I hope you can see, having read Coates, I hope you've read it, um, that Coates is a commentator, and he's a commentator of the first, first order. I mean, he's, he's maybe not the most famous writer in America, uh, but he is a very powerful writer. And um, he's been writing for a long time, and he's written some articles, some uh, essays, some uh, stories that have gained some notoriety. One of the ones he wrote was on reparations, on why, uh, as, a, as a nation, we should very seriously consider giving reparations to African Americans for, the sla for the slavery. It was a, it's a powerful article. It's well worth looking up because um, it makes a case for something that we may think would be no way, in no way be possible. Coates's uh, Between the World and Me, if you don't know, won the National Book Award for 2015. It's a really famous book, and it's a really powerful book. Um, and uh, reading it now in 2016, you get to be maybe uh, some of the first people that you know that read this book, because it's a fairly new one. What we want to do as we read it is to understand what Coates is saying about the African American experience, to understand his story and his ideas, but we also want to look at it as commentary. Really pay attention to the spaces where Coates is speaking as a commentator, where he's making us understand things in new ways. And I just want to, um, as I did with Cornell West, I just want to read one passage for you that where I think Coates is really making the world cohere for me in a new way. I guess before I do that, before I read that, let me say, uh, you may not have noticed, but I'm white. I'm middle-aged. I'm, I'm mi middle-class. I'm, I'm, I'm a white dude. Um, Coates and I, Coates is actually about seven years younger than me. So uh, he was coming of age, or, or becoming a teenager in the middle of the 80s. I became a teenager a little bit earlier than that. So his world experience is a little bit different just on the basis of what was happening in the world. But, of course, our world experiences are entirely different on the basis of how we grew up and who we grew up with. So reading Coates is, is an important experience for me as a white man to understand where he came from, what his experience was, and what the experience of um, African Americans who grew up in the 80s and the 90s was as they grew up in the city. I want to uh, read a passage from Coates that is particularly powerful for me. Um, and it's powerful for me because it sort of mentions me. I mean, not me, Mike Hill, but me as white kid. Here's the passage. It comes from page 20 to 21. Somewhere out there, beyond the firmament, past the asteroid belt, there were other worlds where children did not regularly fear for their bodies. I knew this because there was a large television resting in my living room. In the evenings, I would sit before this television, bearing witness to the dispatches from this other world. There were little white boys with complete collections of football cards, and their only want was a popular girlfriend, and their only worry was poison oak. That other world was suburban and endless, organized around pot roasts, blueberry pies, fireworks, ice cream sundaes, immaculate bath bathrooms, and small toy trucks, that were loosed in the wooden, wooded backyards with streams and glens. Comparing these dispatches with the facts of my native world, I came to understand that my country was a galaxy, and that this galaxy stretched from the pandemonium of West Baltimore to the happy hunting grounds of Mr. Belvedere. I obsessed over the distance between that other sector of space and my own. I knew that my portion of the American galaxy 
where bodies were enslaved by a, tenacious, by a tenacious gravity, was black, and that the other, liberated portion, was not. I knew that some inscrutable energy preserved the breach. I felt, but did not yet understand, the relation between that other world and me. And I felt in this a cosmic injustice, a profound cruelty, which infused an abiding, irrepressible desire to unshackle my body and achieve the velocity of escape. It's pretty easy for me as a uh, middle-class white man, middle-aged middle-class white man, a person who, um, who grew up in a world where maybe my biggest worry was losing a toy car in a forest behind my house. Or maybe my biggest worry was finding a girlfriend, which is often difficult, or uh, whether or not my football cards were properly organized. You know, there's some idealism there in what Coates is writing about. Obviously, everybody has worries. Everybody has struggles. Everybody has problems. And, and Coates is idealizing the world of the little white boy. But, you know, I recognize some of what he's talking about. And my world was not a world where I had to worry about my body, where I had to worry about walking out into the street. In fact, my world was a world where I was encouraged to go out in the, in the street so I'd get away from my mom. It could be that while I read this, or if I don't read this, I might look at Coates's anger or Coates's um, questioning of our country, or I might look at Coates's questioning of um, of what America means, and I might say, "Well, he's just an angry black man, or he just doesn't really understand freedom, or he doesn't really care about freedom or care about the country." And if he doesn't like the country, why doesn't he just move, just leave? Because this is this is America. One of the powers of writing is that I don't think you can read what Coach just read and read the parts around it where he talks about walking in the streets and fearing for his life. I don't think you can read that. And then the later parts where he talks about school and the, and the oppressiveness of school. I don't think you can read how Coates, as a boy, as a person, was caught up in this bind between two worlds. And how that bind is a type of continual slavery. If you don't read Coates, or if you don't read something like Coates, it is too easy to completely dismiss the arguments about race and conflict in our culture. It's too easy to hear something like Black Lives Matter and think it's just a bunch of people who are whining. And so you say all lives matter. But reading Coates makes us have to question our own positions. It makes us understand the world world from a different position. And it makes us understand the world might cohere in a way that we hadn't thought of. That's the power of commentary. I'm asking you to, uh, to engage in that power. And I, here I'll just uh, make draw another connection. I posted a paper that I've written, um, which is also commentary. Now my paper, different from Coates, is a very academic commentary. It's dealing with philosophy, it's dealing with, um, with theory, and it's talking about democracy at a, at a deeper level, uh, and I don't mean deeper level, at a um, more academic level than what Coates is talking about. But there, it's still a commentary, and it's still a commentary that is trying to make the concept of democracy and the concept of what is our power as an individual within a democracy more clear. I, I wrote that paper um, as a student, and I, I posted it for you um, to read as part of the week's reading because of a couple of things. One, I think it's important that you, that you see your teachers as writers, teachers as engaging in coming up with ideas in the same way that they ask you to. And I, wrote, I posted it because I think it's a, a decent commentary, even if some of it's um, really trying to make a higher level academic argument, I think it's a really decent commentary. Um, but one of the things that, that I reflected on was uh, my daughter uh, gave me this book for Christmas a couple years ago. Um, there it is. 
and there's her inscription. You saw that I have an eight-year-old. He interrupted my uh, comments a couple weeks ago. I also have a 25-year-old. And one of the powers of books is that it can change the 25-year-old's life, or it can change the 20-year-old's life, or the 22-year-old's life. It can make them reconsider the, the things that they believe and make them see power where they hadn't seen it before. My daughter gave me this book because she was um, away in the world doing, uh, going, she was in the Peace Corps. She was serving in Paraguay, and she started reading James Baldwin, who is an amazing writer. And if you've never read James Baldwin, you, you must read James Baldwin. And she started reading James Baldwin, which led her to ta Coates, who was very influenced by James Baldwin. And she just had to share it with me because it changed her conception of her own whiteness. Commentary can change people's lives. It can make us think about things in ways that we never thought about them. I invite you to um, go and talk about my daughter or talk about my commentary or talk about my paper or to talk about your paper, your commentary in message board two in the forum, I'm sorry, in, I forget what number it is, forum eight, I think, where, where I ask you to talk about commentary. Talk about the struggles that you're having with your writing. Ask me questions about my writing. Let's, let's really work out what it means to write a commentary. Um, I'm running out of steam. Uh, you're probably running out of steam too. One of the uh, comments about the class was that uh, the videos are too long. Just imagine if you had to sit in that class with me for an hour. Um, but I just wanted to uh, encourage you to keep thinking, keep working. Use our online space to work out your ideas. Use our readings to think about how you can develop your own commentary. Um, and uh, let's, let's write really great commentaries. There is so much happening in the world. There is so much happening every day in the news that you could... Uh, make more meaningful for people, especially people who aren't paying all that much attention. Make the world meaningful. Make it cohere for us in a way that we hadn't thought of before. I look forward to talking with you more in the forums. Have a great week. Again, as always, let me know if you've got any problems or questions.